This video is in classical Latin, with an accurately reconstructed pronunciation of the times of the Principate, 1st century AD, the early empire. English subtitles are available, but I strongly suggest you not use them the first time you watch. Let the sound of the ancient language surround you, and live a time travel-like experience. Test your ability to understand fluently spoken Latin, and once that's done, turn on the subtitles and watch again. Salvete, nobiles mei, ex optati revenitis ad canale meum, hic metatron vos allucor. Odie de lorica segmentata loquemur. Per nomen ipsum incipiemus, lorica segmentata, num se quocatur ab antiquis romanis. Pro dolor quo pacto recte vocaretur, hoc lorica e genus a romanis neminens scire constat, hoc nomen lorica segmentata novatum est, ascolaribus ominibus saeculi sexti decimi. Tamen lorica segmentata est ipsissimum genus loica e quod repente in mente muenit quando cunque cogitemus de militibus romanis. Propterea quod sae piusculet ot stenditur, nec raro in modo cui contra cronologia rerum gestarum pugnat. Hic autem est legionarius imperi romani cui primo fere saeculo militavat, Gaio Iulio Caesare Octaviano Augusto Regnante. Hic vero miles rei publicae militans in legione Iuli Caesaris, in Gallia. Videlicet rei publicae legionarius lorica segmentata armatus parum historicus est. Secundum historicos, spatium trecentorum anorum lorica segmentata adibita est. Omnibus alis saeculis lorica hamata, qua est lorica anellis perreis instructa, usitatior est, apud romanos. Oporte tanca esse imaginen quae ad mente nostra redeat. Neque ista. En videmus lorica segmentata in praeclara columna Traiani de Pictan, haec enin columna triumphalis in foro Traiani Roma esita, monumentum i bipositum post victoria iusdem principis Traiani victoriam in bello daco. Lorica qua hic videmus, vero ad modum speciosast, neque enim accurate veri similen, lorica segmentata repra esentat, e andem dificultatem per cipimus in gale iscutisque, quae nimis parua sunt, Portasis artis causa, quam obrennum recte de epicta sint suspicor, esse propter magnitudinem. Ut exemplum den, scutum, quicque pod singula militum operiat. Crassitudo laminarum ferrearum prorsus variabilis est in ipsa lorica, a septem decimis partibus millimetrorum ad tria millimetra, spississimis vero laminis sumerorum quae pars ni mirum, portissimast. Lorica e laminae sunt in nexa e fiibulis orica alci, ansis aeneis lorisque scorteis. Mea versio quam hic videtis, cu propuro utitur ad in nexus laminarum corporis, atque orica alco ad umeros et lamina spectoris. Pondus universe a septem ad novem kiliogrammata soletesse. Lorica certo mutata ad ipsum militem, lorica e forma sinit militi, magna facultatem se movendi. Propter per multa inventa archaeologica iam compertum abemus diversis formis praebitan esse loricam hanc per imperium romanum, forsitan statibus evolutionis suius loricae, ita sunt formae, una quae calcris evocatur a nomine oppidi in Germania, quo eius fragmenta inventa sunt, alias forma Corbridge tipus A et B in Britannia inventa, forma Newstead ex Caledonia tandem Alba Iulia in Romania inventa. Forma calcrise verisimiliter ipsa est qua utebantur milites cui mortui sunt in proelio silvae teutoburgensis. Duoque genera abemus, alterum veterius, alterum modernusculum ac multiplexius, firiquidem potesteam esse inter primas formas prototipicas. Forma Corbridge pro clausurae mecanica ratione lororum scorteorum cum hamis metallicis, probabiliter visa est firmior. Tipus A, lora scorte aservat ad colligendas laminas pectorales ad reliquan loricam, dum tipus B, utitur hamis metallicis, que uhic in mea versione verisimili potestis videre, quae est Corbridge tipus B. E quadraginta laminis constata ec forma, apparatus collaris et umerorum constiterunt, e viginti quatuor laminis, et cingulo sedecin laminae. Fragmenta forma e Newstead qua imputeo principiorum a edifici inventa sunt, in oppido Newstead in Caledonia. Iterum nobis monstrant pauc sillo mutatam forman, iam numero segmentatorum minore, ultimo quidem maximo. 
Alba Iulia est forma tarda verisimiliter secundo aut tertio saeculo post Christum, et illa maxime differta balis nem petardior forma, quanqua imagines quasi quidemus sunt reconstructiones hypetheticae. Intercommoda cuius generis lorica e uno est eius potestatem protegendi legionari umeros perbene. Oportet non me minis escutum romanum, quod es satis magnum, primum praesidium est militi, axi reecte ad ibebitur, protectionem optimam, prae bebit asura, usque ad clauiculam. Bene, nobiles mei, spero fore ut haec pellicula tibi placuerit, et si ita, mementote, pollice probando fauendum, Subscribendusque se meo canali, ad plura metatronis, et mementote, metatron, sua sala spansit. Valete. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking, and for those of you who are here for the first time, well, welcome to my channel, my name is Dr. Raffaello Urbani, I'm a fully qualified linguist, language teacher, and language expert, and today I'm here to coach you, to teach you how to pronounce Latin, uh, being more authentic to the period that you are reenacting, for example, if you're creating an impression for a Roman soldier of either the late Republic or the early Empire. I was born and bred in Palermo, Sicily, and I'm a native speaker of Italian. Now, it doesn't really matter if you're from the UK or America, and you just want to get rid of your American or English accent when you pronounce Latin, you want to sound more authentic, particularly improving the quality of your consonants, vowels, and your intonation. Or it doesn't matter if you're Italian and you're just, you know, you're used to pronouncing Latin in the ecclesiastical pronunciation, which is what is normally taught here in Italy, pushed by the Catholic Church, obviously, because it's the pronunciation used by the Holy See, and you're just intrigued by this reconstructed classical pronunciation. What Whatever the case, by the end of this video, you will sound just like me. You will sound fluent and you will sound authentic when you pronounce your Latin. Okay, but before diving into the actual coaching, I want to first defend my points. I want to make sure you don't just believe me that this is what people sounded like in a urban pronunciation of Latin in the first century, both BC and AD, we're going to look at the difference between those two, but I want to bring to you empirical evidence, archaeological evidence, the actual sources, so that you don't just believe me, but I'm going to prove to you why I have chosen specific pronunciations uh, in this video in the first five minutes that you have already watched. Now that's important, because you will definitely find comments down below with people saying that either this is all stupid and silly because Latin is a dead language so no one speaks it and no one can speak it, which I mean I've just proven in the first five minutes that that's not true, or uh, you will have people saying that it's impossible, that we linguists are stupid because, you know, there were no recordings, we don't have any vocal message uh, on WhatsApp of an ancient Roman, and so it's impossible to know what ancient Romans sounded like. Now you should frown upon both both kinds of comments because they are very ignorant. They come from a place of ignorance and I don't mean this as an attack or an insult, it's just a matter of fact. These people who say these things haven't spent one minute looking at the sources because today I'm going to show you with the sources with almost absolute certainty that this is a very authentic sound for a Latin speaker of the first century AD. And mind you, by definition, a dead language is a language with no native speakers, not a language that is not spoken or cannot be spoken. In fact, there are more than 20,000 Latin speakers to this day that do use Latin on a daily basis and keep it alive. Well, first, let's start with long and short vowels in Latin. Latin differentiates very much between A and A, O and O, E and E, E and E, and so forth. We are talking about vowel quantity. It's a matter of length, length being the duration of time that a particular sound is held before proceeding to the next sound in a word. All Latin grammarian of the period never shut up about the importance of the difference between short and long vowels. We know that it was a very important thing everyone tells us about it. But how can we know which ones are long and which ones are short? We don't have any recording, blah, blah, blah. Well, they told us. Let me show you. Look at this inscription on stone which dates to the first century precisely. You will notice that sometimes the eyes in Latin are taller than others that are shorter. That is the way Latin speakers told us that those taller eyes are supposed to be pronounced longer. So, fili, luci. As for the other vowels, the Latins wrote an apex, right on top of the vowels that were supposed to be long. That's how we can know that a word such as protegendi is supposed to have a long O, 
protegendi rather than protegendi. Phonemic vowel length is extremely important also to fully appreciate Latin poetry. Now, if you want videos that go very in details about all of these proofs, then check out both Polymathy and Scorpio Martiano's channel. You will find links in the description below. It's going to be packed with very useful links, very professional teaching aids. And thank you, Luke, for your help in the production of this video. Next one, how do we know that the C in classical Latin was always pronounced like a K? So it's Cicero, not Cicero, Caesar, not Cesar, Centurio, not Centurio. You get the point. Well, first of all, we see that in classical Latin, the K does appear on words such as Cartago, but these words can also be spelled with a C, suggesting that the two sounds are interchangeable. But Quintilian is really the one that helps us out here. He tells us the following in Latin. An rursus alia redundent, ca quae et ipsa quorundam nominum nota est, et cu, cuius similis effectus specieque, nisi quod paulum a nostris obliquatur, coppa apud graecos, nunc tantum in numero manet. Which translates, again, there is the question whether certain letters are not superfluous. For instance, K, which is also used as an abbreviation for certain nouns, and Q, which though slanted slightly more by us, resembles, both in sound and shape, the Greek coppa, now used by the Greeks solely as a numerical sign. So here Quintilian shows us that both K and Q are redundant. But how can it be redundant if you don't already have in the Latin alphabet a letter that sounds just like them? In this case, the C. He's telling us we don't need Ks, we've already got Cs, because Cs in Latin sounded like K. They all three have the same sound, they're just used differently by convention. What did the R sound like? Well, if you want to pronounce Latin properly, you need to learn how to trill your R into a R, just like an Italian, an alveolar trill, if you will. Now, I know that there are popular videos on YouTube that tell you no, it shouldn't be rolled like the Italian, it should have a single tap. Let me tell you why that's wrong. First of all, Latin writers differentiate between single R and double R. And that's very important because it tells us that they have a different sound. Because at the time, Latin was reproducing coherently the sounds that were created. And it's very difficult to have a different sound between a single R and a double R when you only have a single tap, such as in languages like, such as Japanese, that do have a single tap R, not a polyvibrant like Italian, and in fact, never geminate or double their R's. Instead, Italian does, and so does Spanish, for instance. But most importantly, Gaius Lucilius likens the sound of the R to the sound of a dog. So, a dog growling in modern Italian would normally say grrr. Now, given, you could also come up and tell me, well, yes, but if you do it with an English R, it would sound grrr. Now, that could hold water, but then here is what other Latin writers tell us. They tell us that it also is supposed to vibrate. So, that really kills it. If it sounds like a dog growling and it's supposed to vibrate at the same time, it's going to be grrr. So it's a r. The M is a vowel at the end of words. I know, that's a shocker. So, a fully nasalized vowel. You don't say Imperium Romanum. You say Imperium Romanum. It's ever so slightly pronounced as a nasalized sound. It's not supposed to be an M. And this is the hardest one for me as an Italian. I really have to focus and sometimes I still slip. But how do we know? I've got a very good one for this one. Servius the grammarian tells us, Mioticism happens whenever we start a following word that starts with a vowel with a final M or a previous word, such as hominem amicum. We can avoid this vice error either by pausing or by removing the final M entirely. So here Servius is telling us, if you don't want to sound like a barbarian and you want to sound like a proper Roman, either take a pause, hominem, amicum, or if you don't take a pause and you go all fluent about it, just drop it, homine amicum. Now this is important, also because if you look at Romance languages, they all dropped the M's. I mean, look at the Italian word mese, which means month, that comes from vulgar Latin mese, which itself comes from classical Latin mensen, where you can see that both the N in the middle and the M at the end were dropped. And why were they both dropped? Because they sounded the same. They were nasalized, not fully pronounced. How do we know that the V does not sound like a V, but it sounds like a W? Like in winum, weterius, 
Now, this can sound strange to modern-day Romance language speakers, and as an Italian it would be more natural for me to pronounce it like a V, but the Romans didn't. And we know this because, first of all, surrounding languages that are trying to recreate the sound of Latin words that begin with a V tend to write it as a U, which already kind of gives, like the Greeks do this, which already kind of gives us the idea that if the Romans pronounce it like a V, then why the heck are they using a U to recreate that sound? But more importantly, it, words that come from Latin, very famous, that reach the English language are winum and wallum, wine and wall, respectively. Now notice how English uses a W to this day, which tells us that that's what they sounded like at the time. The Romans didn't say vinum, they said winum, and that's why it becomes wine, and they said wallum, which does turn into wall. And we see this all the time. I mean, look at the word Augustus. It's spelled with V's, but I don't think anyone is expecting you to pronounce it Agvustvust. I mean, good luck doing that. We already know that the V can sound like a U. It also can sound like a W at the beginning of words. And look at words such as Silva, which means forest. It is, by Virgil, spelt both with a V and with a U, suggesting that they had the same sound. How do we know that the H is fully pronounced? Because in the ecclesiastical pronunciation, which follows Italian rules, the H is dropped. Because in Italian, the H is not pronounced. So words such as lorica, hamata, is going to sound amata. But we know that the Latins pronounce the H, hamata. How do we know? Well, that's actually quite a simple one. We have Roman grammarians scolding the youth because they're dropping the H's. And they tell us it's supposed to be pronounced hostiae, not Ostiae, and they specifically drop the H to tell us that that's the incorrect one. And we see that the rustic versions of Latin, uneducated people, were starting to drop the H's in words such as hic, which means here, spelling it like a ik, and grammarians and Latin people of upper class complaining about it. If you complain about people dropping their H's in pronunciation, it means that you're supposed to pronounce them. A very similar thing about the I, so the fully pronounced diphthong instead of the simplified E that we find in ecclesiastical Latin. We know it's Caesar, not Cesar, because we again have many grammarians and authors lamenting the fact that in the rustic, non-urban version of Latin, people are starting to pronounce the I as a simple E, and they tell us that that's not the proper way of speaking. So, our legionary that I recreated in the first five minutes is clearly a legionary who was born and brought up in a city, and he speaks with a proper, fully pronounced I. So what about the S? How should the S sound? Well, first of all, in classical Latin, the coronal sibilant S was likely unvoiced in all positions. So if you see an S, don't pronounce it like a Z. Never. You can do it in ecclesiastical, but not in classical. Now, if you're an English speaker, or if you're an Italian from either Midland or the South, you will have what are called laminal S's, which are pronounced in the front of the mouth. S. Now, you can use these, but if you want to really sound very authentic, considering that you're trying to recreate what would the majority of Latin speakers have sounded like, then you should go for a retracted S. A retracted S is what you hear both in Spanish and in Northern Italian. And when I say Northern Italian, I'm talking about like Emilia Romagna, Friuli, sh, rather than a S. Silvae, rather than Silvae, Romanis rather than Romanis. Now, I sometimes go for the full frontal S, which is more natural for me, but other times I go for the retracted S, Abalis, Abalis. If you want to sound more authentic, you should go for that one, but, but probably there were some speakers that just used frontal S's, so your choice. So now you've got all of this, you've got your classical pronunciation, you're strong and you're sure about it, how do you sound better? Well, first of all, you of course need to learn which vowels are long and which ones are short, but you can use, you can find just Latin with macrons and you will find it. This is not difficult to find. And that's important because, for example, I hate it when I hear people say lorica segmentata. I hate it because it's not lorica, it's lorica. Both vowels are long. Lorica. Lorica. Not lorica. Lorica segmentata. Subligaculum. Not subligaculum. The rule of the antepenult. So you stress the vowel that is not the last one, not the one before, the one before that. For example, you don't say divide et impera, you say divide et impera. That's the rule of the antepenult. But speed is extremely important. 
So what do I mean by that? Let's say that you are memorizing something in Latin because you're doing your impression and then you want to impress your friends and so you want to pronounce Latin and you do it extremely quickly because you memorized, you know this full sentence and you say it quick. Well, you need to be careful with that because sure, it will, you will show off your ability to memorize, that's great, but you won't sound very authentic. On the other hand, it is also important not to go too slowly because sometimes people tell me, oh, you speak Latin too quickly, go slowly, but nobody speaks like this in any language. So, doing this, no, but don't go too fast. The equilibrium is in the middle. Let me give you a few examples. If I wanted to go super fast, I could go Prodolor quopacto recte vocaretur hoc lorica genus aromanis neminens kir constat hoc nomen lorica segmentata novatum est ascolaribus hominibus saeculi sexi decimis. Tamen lorica segmentata est ipsissimum genus lorica quod repente in mente muenit quando unque cogitemus de militibus romanis proptere quod sae piuscule tot stendi turne crare in modo qui contra cronologia reunum gestarum pugnat. Ok, does that give you a good feeling? No. So you're showing off that you can memorize well, but as you can notice, I didn't go full speed on my presentation. Sometimes I speed up, but I slow down, particularly for words that I particularly like, such as praesidium, primum praesidium, but also for words that I want people to listen to, words that I think are key into the sentence. So, don't go too fast, don't go too slow, Go in the middle, occasionally accelerate, speed up, and then slow down again. And just go like that, and that will make a huge difference in your ability to speak Latin. Propter per multa inventa archaeologica iam compertum abemus diversis formis praevitan esse lorica hang per imperium romanum. As you can see, I don't say everything at the same speed. I modulate. The vowel quality. Now here's another important one. Now if you're recreating a late Republican sort of speaker, then you can open all of your vowels. You can pronounce them as A, E, I, O, U, and then A, E, I, O, U for the long ones. You don't need to close them. You can open them. So, valete, salvete. Now if you notice, that's not how I pronounce them. I close them. So I went into valete, salvete. That's absolutely fine for a first century because we know that towards the end of the first century is when closed vowels, so E rather than E, started to become common in the Italian peninsula. Now if you're an Italian, you can already immediately distinguish the difference between open and closed, so you can choose open them, close them, doesn't matter, someone will have done it. But if you're an Anglophone speaker, these, the difference between E and E might be too small. I'll give you an example though. Let's look at words such as head and red. Now in English, even in England today, we're looking at British English for a moment, these are open, red, head. But in very old RP and in estuary Cockney version of London speech, sometimes these are closed into red, head. That's the difference of quality between open and closed. In Latin, you can use any one, really. Particularly if you're first century, you can close them. I personally prefer the sound of salvete. And in terms of Roma versus Roma, it's up to you, really. But if you're an Anglophone speaker, make sure, and this is the most important part, that your vowels are, I like to say, dry. So, no single vowel, even when they are long, never make them into a diphthong. So in English, if I had to speak Italian with an English accent, I would say grazie, Italian is grazie, radio becomes radio, a, o, e. No one says grazie, there is no a, it's e, grazie. In English, a lot of vowels are double. You have I, you have A, you have O. Well, these don't exist in Italian and they don't exist in Latin. Those are English approximations. Don't use English approximations. Short E is a E. It's not a E, uh, like in sit. That sound is Germanic, it has nothing to do with Latin, nor does it have anything to do with Romance languages. Another very important one for Anglophone speakers, work on your U. It's not gladius, S. It's gladius, us. It's a fully pronounced u, always. Not Augustus, Augustus, Augustus. Julius Caesar, not Julius Caesar. So work on your u and pronounce your e as if you were an Italian or a Spanish trying to speak English. So English. Okay, I think I've given you a lot of information, but if you like this, I can make another one and go even more into the details. But if you want more details right now, click 
onto links in the description that will take you to Polymathy, where my friend Luke, who is a very talented linguist, will take you into a journey onto how to improve your pronunciation of classical Latin, the Latin spoken between the 1st century BC and the 2nd century AD. Have fun!